The Annex is a production of the Queen's Podcast Lab. For more, visit queenspodcastlab.org. This is The Annex, a sociology podcast. I'm Joseph Cohen from Queen's College in the City University of New York. Today, we present the second of our two-part series on the sociology of cults. Our guest featured in this episode is Craig Rawlings of Duke University. Craig recently published Cognitive Authority and the Constraint of Attitude Change in Groups in the American Sociological Review. And we're going to talk about groups, belief systems, and uh, how groups structure our way of thinking. Craig Rawlings from Duke. Coming up next. So this is the second part of a two-part series on the sociology of cults. To get some backstory on it, uh, check out the previous episode in our podcast feed. It featured a great discussion with Rick Moore from Washington University of St. Louis, who explained that the lay person's idea of cults is kind of value-laden and not seen as a very productive starting point for understanding the phenomenon that you and I would know as cults. And we got into the details of uh, new religious movements, and uh, through the discussion, uh, Rick pushed me to think narrowly about what specifically it was about cults that interested me, and we settled on the fact that Sometimes cults can manipulate people's ways of seeing the world in pretty wild ways. And Rick gave me the very good advice of pursuing an expert who studies exactly that. And in this episode, the second of our two-part series, we're going to sit down with such an expert. Me and Rick are going to sit down with Craig M. Rawlings from Duke University. I learned a lot in this. I hope you enjoy it too. Craig Rawlings, next. We are here with Craig Rawlings of Duke University. Uh, Welcome, Craig. Thank you. Great to be here. And joining us again is Rick Moore from Washington University, St. Louis. Great to be here. So Craig recently published uh, a piece, uh, an excellent piece in the American Sociological Review called Cognitive Authority and the Constraint of Attitude Change in Groups. And he is the person who we are looking for Craig, let me start you off. I'll give you some background, okay? Okay. So around New Year's, I was watching this HBO documentary on Heaven's Gate. And uh, this is around New Year's. And and, and the piece boggles my mind. You know, just the idea that some group could move people to kill themselves, you know, go against their basic instinct. What's going on there? And then after that comes the uh, election and the capital invasion where I see like a conspiracy theory has moved people to like invade the capital and get in a lot of trouble. And I I walk away with this huge interest in cults. I'm like, well, I'm a sociologist. I must be able to find somebody who understands cults. And I'm speaking with, uh, with Rick and Rick makes a great point. He's and Rick, stop me if I'm. I, I want to paraphrase you and then just to see if active listening, whatnot. Sounds great. So what I gathered from Rick was Rick was saying, okay, cults is a very sort of emotionally infused term, mm-hmm. and really what cults are is they are examples of new religious movements. Some of them are pro-social, some of them are anti-social. There's a wide range. You know, if you, you if I want to start like a vegan yoga branch of Judaism, that's kind of a cult too. Already exists. Yeah, oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm married to a cantor for sure. I see that. <laughs> so really what what Rick told me is you really have to focus on the mechanism that you're interested in, which is the process by which some type of group belief comes to overtake a person's personal belief system or structure this belief system. Did I did I get that right, Rick? I think that's more or less on track. I would just add that that that, like you said, that the cults is a very not only emotionally laden term, but that it's kind of the 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 use of cults, kind of like going back to like classic like labeling theory. You know, things get labeled as a cult and it has consequences. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's pathologizing for one. Yes, exactly. I just have to tell you, my wife worked at the Marie Callender's where Heaven's Gate had their last meal, so. 
Oh no! <laughs> a personal link to the start. <laughs> it's a first of all. It's always a great. I always love getting one like the core lessons in sociology. It's a great reminder, right? Not to pathologize, not to lump things together, and to be specific about the mechanisms that you're talking about. So I I love that reminder, and and that's that's a great thing to put out there, anyways. But so I read your ASR piece. And wow, there was a ton to chew on. There's a ton to chew on on that topic. And I thought maybe uh, uh, we could start off with you, uh, you know, just giving us the the rundown of the article, because I'm sure you got like a nice polished package. So <laughs> you want to start off maybe just telling us about the article? Sure. So the article really stems from a long interest in these kinds of small groups. Some of them go by the term commune and some a little bit we get into this ter- territory where we start to think of them as, as being cults or cult-like. This data set I've been working with for a number of years, it's the urban communes data. So it was collected in the 1970s, beginning in the 70s by Ben Zablocki. I actually was at Rutgers originally as a grad student and worked um, while well, I TA'd for, for Ben. Um, and so I've known about this data through John Levy Martin, who's also uh, worked with it a lot. And yeah, so I, this idea that really John Martin kind of initiated, which is well built off of Durkheim, this idea that that people are basically incapable on their own through their own willpower of generating a kind of constraint to their to their attitudes and beliefs. That it takes something external, a kind of cognitive leader, you know, someone who can make these kinds of webs of connections especially across domains. Like if you're going to be connecting things about your diet to things about spirituality, then it's, it's like we're not wired to do that, right? That's We're cognitive misers. It's just like that sort of thing. Like why would I possibly connect these domains? It takes somebody to do that for us. So it's like I, I love that part first. So you're saying that our beliefs are all interconnected. Is that is that what I'm gathering? What I'm saying is that for most people, they are not. For most people, okay. they are highly compartmentalized, right? That that's oh, what okay. we do. Like in general, we we are very, very good at coming up with sort of ad hoc explanations for why you can smoke and be a vegan at the same time, because you've compartmentalized those. They're not connected in some overarching ideology of health and who knows what else might might make the connections. We need some sort of uh, authority outside of ourselves to connect them. And then the real, the real contribution of the paper, I think, is that I link it with interpersonal dynamics, right? So it's not just that this leader, you know, tells us what to think and we obey the leader, right? It's that the, the leader facilitates a kind of group dynamic in which we are constantly you know, testing one another's attitudes and probing them because that's the basis of our collective effervescence is this ideology, is probing into whether these things are connected. And so we, there's, there's no selective disclosure. We're not hiding from each other. This isn't our dysfunctional families or just our just families in general at Thanksgiving where we don't talk about religion and politics. This is we are talking about all of these things and trying to figure out whether or not they make sense. That's a source of tension when we find out that we disagree with one another. So it's really about this, this underlying collective effervescence that somebody like a cognitive authority, a charismatic leader, in this, not in the Weberian sense, but in the, in the sense of like the, the group itself becoming charis- a charismatic group. So – For example, so what I'm gathering you to be saying is that when you have a a, a group of people, we like to think that there is some type of ideational harmony among us that we share values. But chances are, in fact, not only do we probably not share a lot of values, but we probably don't even adhere to a lot of the values that we think we adhere to. And in any setting... Uh, or in a group setting, we often turn to a person who gives us sort of the the words or ideas to uh, smooth over those differences or ignore them or move past them. Is that what you're saying? It's almost like there's a specialized role in a group? 
It could be. I, I think more often that without a cognitive authority, we just lie to each other and we lie to ourselves. Sure. So James Kitts has a, a great uh, bit of research talking about like these vegetarian households that were basically, if you actually see how many people are actually eating meat, it's quite a few, right? But most of the people don't realize that other people are eating meat because you live in a vegetarian household. You're not supposed to disclose that. So you um, create these little opportunities to sneak off and, and do that, or you don't talk about it. But also that was something that varied, right? So in some of these households where the networks are stronger, then it's harder to hide. It's harder to be a meat eater in there. And you, it's, it's disclosed. What I'm saying is that it is the job of uh, the leader of a group like that to keep tabs on people, to make sure that they become cops for each other, that they basically, that the, the group dynamic is one in which they are feeling terrible if they violate the, you know, a worldview, the, cons- the inconsistencies, they start to see the inconsistencies because it's not in our heads, right? We're not able to keep the consistent, uh, you know, worldview in our heads. It's kept in the group and in the group dynamic. And the job of the, the the leaders in that group is to facilitate that kind of intensity. And the followers themselves really want that because all of that, you know, is part of what gives them the exhilaration of, of being in a group like that. That's kind of why they're there. Oh, this is interesting. So what I'm gathering then is I might have watched he- the Heaven's Gate documentary and seen all of these people professing to believe that like aliens are going to come and pick them up on the hill bop comet. And I might have thought that those ideational commitments are sort of the core motive that drove these people to kill themselves. Whereas I'm listening to you and I'm hearing that no social integration is the core motive. Right. And all of these articulations of belief are really the manifest behaviors of people who are trying to keep a group together. That's right. That's right. That's what I believe to be true. And I think that that's what uh, John Martin and others have, you know, uh, connected this idea of having a a real belief system like that. That's part of that. Um, It's interwoven with that dynamic of belonging. So it's that paradox, that Durkheimian paradox, that they are killing themselves for the group. Uh, Rick, I don't want to uh, crowd you out if you have something to chime in. Uh, you know, I sort of do this New York Jewish style where everybody just yells <laughs> over each other. So, uh, uh, I love it. No, uh, fascinating, fascinating discussion going on here. And it sounds so it reminds me of, you know, teaching, teaching the book Suicide, right? To students yeah. and and going through the different kinds. I don't remember off the top of my head which one is the <laughs> which one is which. I always need to review it. But but it's very much in that vein. My question for Craig, in this kind of group dynamic, and you have this, this as you say, charismatic leader, um, are there sub-leaders? Are there other people that kind of like do similar things? I'm just thinking of, of say, religious organizations mm-hmm. that have, that might be relatively large and then have smaller groups that meet, for yeah. example. Mm-hmm. No, totally. So, in fact, the, the, the main measure in the paper is that there are some groups that have a big charismatic leader, um, but the the groups themselves have these resident lieutenants mm-hmm. who represent that leader. So there are some groups that were very small that had, you know, a charismatic leader who lived in the group. But in general, that's not the case, right? General, these are larger sort of, uh, of you know, new uh, kinds of religious movements that have a guru, that have a big, a big, uh, charismatic leader, a lot of them Eastern inspired at that time, but they had a resident lieutenant. That person was very much monitoring and reporting back Mm. to the main leader. So there is this kind of emerging kind of hierarchy and some of the groups belong to a kind of federation of others. What do you mean federation? Well, just like you could imagine uh, that there are uh, certain movements that are you know, where they would have many different Mm -hmm. uh, communes federated under one leader. So they have separate resident lieutenants in each of these households in the data set. One of them was under the pseudonym Love from Above. (laughs) So if you were part of the Love from Above uh, Federation, right, you were all kind of 
on the same page about, you know, what you're what you're doing here. Wow. I find this take really fascinating in a lot of ways because it, it's putting some pieces of the puzzle together for me. Yeah. Like, for example, I remember reading a piece about uh, how to make outreach to people who are uh, sort of veneered with conspiracy theories, how to talk to your <laughs> uh, your QAnon believing relative. And one thing that they often say is uh, to not speak out against the people who hold the belief, to not make fun of QAnon believers. Now, in light of what you're telling me, that makes a lot of sense, because yeah. if the belief in the conspiracy is really a symptom of social affiliation and you are attacking the group that the person is struggling to affiliate with, then you're not going to win them over. In fact, you're almost, you know, acting against you're, you're you're evoking a defense mechanism. Absolutely. So, you know, I work a lot in this uh, theory, this social psychological theory, balance theory. Right. Mm. So for Tider, we all actually kind of know it a little bit. You know, we know right. about cognitive dissonance. Right. So, you know, just when things don't add up, when you see somebody, you know, um, behaving in a way or you've made a certain kind of commitment that you feel like you're suckered about, you're going to you're going to feel all of this, you know, discomfort around it. And you're, you're likely to, you know, uh, you know, I thought that I thought that so that tr Trump was going to, you know, be president again. And now right. it's like what's happened. Right. It's um, this this isn't, you know, so, you know, so Festinger and others have studied cults for, for a long time. And the sort of um, when prophecy fails, which is a wonderful you know, uh, very relevant book for today, you know, uh, Fessinger shows that this early cult that once the world didn't end, of course, they were even more strongly attached mm. to the the belief. And the leader said, well, it didn't end because we're so great and we we saved the world. Now go out and proselytize because we saved yeah. the world. Right. So balance, that's all sort of anchored in this this theory. Right. And balance theory, you know, proposes that there are like four fundamental rules uh, that operate on our sentiments and our attitudes and beliefs. A friend of a friend is a friend. The enemy of a friend is an enemy. The friend of an enemy is an enemy. Sorry, uh, an enemy, an enemy is a friend. Right? So, um, and, and yet, so it's not, you can put them in those friend and enemy terms, but they're actually, and like the paper is kind of built around this, this other extension of it, which is about beliefs. So if, you can say like if if my friend believes something that I don't believe, then that's tension provoking, right? Mm -hmm. If um, we want to have our sentiments balanced out in this, it's not just about disagreement and agreement. It's also if I dis if I really hate someone and they believe in something that I believe in, then that is also tension provoking. Right. So you, there's this like, you know, Della Posta stuff on like, why do liberals drink lattes? And it's like part of the underlying mechanism generating these kinds of cultural, you know, fragmentation might be that you see a liberal drinking a latte and you're holding a latte and you're, uh. you're very not liberal. <laughs> you're like, put it in the trash. You know, I don't want to be associated with that. Right. <laughs> so, so the point is, is that is a, just, as you said, like the worst thing you can do is confront somebody's relations. Then you just confirm everything that they believed. Like uh, the only way to really generate it is to, uh, is to kind of put the relation on the line in a sense. So it's mm -hmm. like, so you can see this with like coming out strategies for, for gay people in the United States in general and the world really where the, the idea was don't be in the closet. Don't selectively disclose. Don't don't break up with your family. Right. But just be like, I love you, but I'm gay. Right. And mm -hmm. like now you have to choose. Like, are you are you going to be the one who, who severs the relation or are you going to be the one who alters your attitude? Right. Right. And so you and some and people made those choices. Right. And sometimes it was to great sacrifice. Right. Um, uh, you know, people lost good friends, lost good family members. So there was some of that. But on the overarching, you know, pattern is one that I believe that the relation is stronger than the attitude in general, unless you have something like this very strong cognitive authority who can tell you that your everlasting soul or whatever is on the line here. So yeah, you need to change your name and move and cut that relation 
because the belief and the attitude and belonging to this group, right, mm. is more important. So it's like when you're asking someone to change a belief, you might be asking for a lot in a way. Like it might be a very big, even if you are asking them to accept something that is patently factually true, like admit that Joe Biden won the election. To ask somebody to act, to overtly accept it is to ask them to imperil friendships, to imperil like social time. That's right. And then also if they've spent the last four years creating an incredible web of conspiracy around this and that there have been people who really are bordering on these kinds of charismatic authorities, cognitive authorities in the media and politics who've helped to foster that process, that that belief is 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 highly embedded and has been, uh, you know, put into a network of other attitudes connecting all kinds of things. So it's not it's not the same. In general, it's very people change beliefs all the time. They generally don't do it. In, they don't do it in public and they don't do it yeah. while you're arguing with them. <laughs> you know, but they will they will change it. But uh, because, as I said, most people, you know, compartmentalize. Right. Yeah. But if you're in one of these very strong groups in bet where the the there's these strong webs of uh, of interpersonal ties and these strong webs of uh, attitudes that are interrelated, then yes, you are asking a lot, even for a very, very small, something that seems like the tiniest belief. Like, yeah. do you think it's maybe possible that somebody who didn't ever rise above 50% in the, in the, in the popularity might have just lost? No way, right? Because yeah. that just destroys so much, right? Socially. It, it's also interesting on the flip side, because I do remember, so before I went to Queens College Sociology, I was at the Temple University Marketing Department, and I remember somebody saying to me, cults are red hot. <laughs> he's like, he's like, you're a sociologist? Cults are so hot. And, you know, I have read a, a little bit about it. And what was interesting, you saw this a lot when Donald Trump started or uh, first came to power and the uh, what liberal organizers were telling each other. They were saying, build your opposition to Trump around a weekly meeting at the coffee shop. Mm. Make sure that you all, you know, regularly get together mm. and make it a thing. And it almost seems like what the advice there was create a social group that is centered on political opposition to Trump. And if you build those social ties, those people will develop a commitment because they're committed to the friendships yeah. in part. I think that's right. I think that's right. I think that that's the, the, the power of social media, too, is to really facilitate that level of binding. Yeah. But it has a flip side because, like, before social media, let's say Rick's a conservative, you're a liberal. I could just lie about my position to both of you and you'd never know in public conversation. <laughs> But now people are having to make these public declarations that are recordable and capturable. That's right. It's like the worst Thanksgiving dinner ever. <laughs> <laughs> nobody, right. nobody can lie. It's like you suddenly find out you're not a vegetarian and then, <laughs> and then you believe all of this terrible stuff, right? But And at the same time, right, you know, I think it's important that we think of this as a continuum, right? Not like there are cults mm -hmm. and, then there, and then there's not, but there's like there's group commitments, there's there's – the constraint of, of our beliefs and, and there's all of that. And it's like, how strongly are all of those things coming together? And at some point we can go like ideal. Typically this is much closer to that end of like cult, right. In quotations yeah. and over here, it's, but the truth is, I think, you know, you know, we belong to all sorts of groups and we have all kinds of overlapping Zemelian kinds of uh, affiliations. And some of those, you know, are more greedy and more cult like and others aren't. So, you know, when I when I teach undergrads in organizational theory, I'm like, you might already be in a cult, essentially, yeah. or, you know, I might be right. Or, uh, you know, do we really want to, you know, make that hard distinction? Right. 
I think that that continuum raises really inter- interesting questions, especially when, where, for example, talking about the, the, the capital. I was thinking a lot about the capital insurrection or whatever that was, especially because I saw on the news um, the, the dude with the horns, <laughs> the QAnon shaman, right, said, <laughs> you know, I regret doing it. I have no idea. I didn't read the article. Maybe he doesn't regret it. Maybe he's just trying to whatever. But thinking of, you know, how you're charismatic theory might play into something although i would have to say i think we need a different word than cult Mm. because cult is just too value laden and especially Mm -hmm. with there's been a lot of good work out of religious studies kind of showing that what gets labeled as cult is the things that people don't like right so we're calling trump a cult kind of we haven't actually said it but we're kind of insinuating that at the same time we're not calling biden supporters a cult right so i feel like we need a different word because it's just we've lost we've we lose more i think than we gain by referring to this phenomenon what we're talking about which is super interesting i think super important as a cult well i also think cults are an extreme form of social organization and in some ways you know the people who join them are not markedly different than anybody else you know that they get pulled in through social networks, you know, where we get mobilized into lots of groups, right? When they get in, they start to form relations with other people that are deeply satisfying, that are completely feeling totally unalienated in a, in a, a deeply disenchanted world, right? Uh, that, that in a lot of times, right, early stage cults are just full of people who are completely committed and giving giving to the group and you know this is the kind of secret sauce that so many different groups want right like this is what so many firms <laughs> are looking for like how do we get like you know you know the the, the, the a, a group like a mm-hmm. firm is like well we're, our natural system the sort of way that this is a, a like a family right so you have all of these ways that consultants are coming in and trying to actually kind of, you know, and the way I think we should see it is kind of cult up. How do you cult up your organization, right? Mm -hmm. Your leader to be just the right kind of charisma, charismatic leader, (laughs) you know? (laughs) Yeah. But I'd still have to say as an analytical term, it, it's, it's not doing it for me. And I don't just want to say we need to relabel things. Right. Um, But, but there is a scholarship on this issue, right. That, that has investigated, for example, how different religious movements in different countries around the world are officially labeled as cults, right? So you have uh, Jehovah's Witnesses in some European countries being called officially, legally a cult in this pejorative sense. And so for us to, to take up that term and act like it's an uh, analytical category, when in, when in fact it's an emic category that, we should be, that people study how that's used, I think it's a mistake. And I think that, that while the process that we're talking about is super important, super interesting, to say that there is a thing as cults and this is a cult or that is a cult, yeah. I think misses the work that the word cult is actually doing in these situations. It sounds to me like it's really a matter of like dysfunctional friendships or dysfunctional relationships versus pro-social ones. Like I'm sitting here thinking of like Weight Watchers. Weight Watchers is totally functions like a cult. Like people get deep into that stuff, build their whole lifestyle around it. But ultimately the aims are pretty pro-social. Like everybody walks away from that healthier or in an objective, you know, it, like it is likely that your affiliation in that group will result in an objective at least benefit, if not have an inert effect on your objective well-being. Whereas a a cult that pushes you to kill yourself is like objectively not (laughs) very good for your well-being. So I think I'm gathering that what we're talking about are dysfunctional relationships or dysfunctional sort of movements. I think that that's totally right on. And I think that um, that's generally the way I think about it too. Like if you can, if you can actually, if you could actually be in a, a group that was in many ways cult like, but was was not abusive and where it <laughs> this is kind of where it gets into a little bit of like, I think, you know, some theorists would be like, you know, dream on. Right. Yeah. It's like, you know, that there are firms that where you're like, I feel great. Like, do you want to go to work and feel totally alienated or do you want to go <laughs> work and feel like. I love these people. This is great. We're saving the world. We're doing this. But then, you know, it it can become exploitative, whether it's a, a, you know, a small group where the leader then becomes more and more self-infatuated and involved in these abusive relations that, you know, uh, that in some ways 
re reinscribe that person's power or whether or not it's a firm that's brought in consultants to do this to try to you know get the workers to to work harder right it's like i think that key here for me is that i think that right the sociology is we're we're programmed to belong to groups we're happiest when we're in groups that have a certain kind of set of of uh you know commitments and where we where there's not free riding and you know the problem is is as we all know right that that's that's hard to have and that that it's it's oftentimes the case, I think, that these more cult-like groups emerge out of a, a kind of coordination problem that we're failing to actually, you know, achieve. We're falling apart. The group threatens to even disband. So I think that there, there's a strong argument to be said that this is adaptive, that this is how we have evolved, right? That that some point it's like we're either going to disband or we're going to just like say Joe is like magic and he's just represents everything good. We like yeah. pick the person who seems to encapsulate us the most. And we just like, well, let's just do what he says. Cause he's, you know, in touch with something higher than us. I can imagine two flaws with this uh, organizational leadership by cult. The first one is that when I look at, for example, Heaven's Gate, it's like the group is selected on need for affiliation. So if you're going to create an organization like that's like a cult, you have to get rid of the less faithful, regardless of how productive or skilled they are. Like you have to select on that willingness to be kowtowed unless you're going to create. And then the second thing is, is if the cult that you're creating is not part of a group that actually likes each other, that is actually integrating, then doesn't want to be a group. You can't, it, it strikes me that you can't manipulate people to rejigger their thoughts for group, the purposes of group cohesion. If people don't want to, you know, cohere, it's like, like these cults might, I wonder, do they rely on like voluntary, you know how, like you ever see when you were a kid, you went to like the hypnotist, the hypnotist show, and, and and they'd get people that they they purportedly hypnotize the kids and get them to do whatever. But at the end of it, you found out it was just the kids who wanted to clown around on stage. The people who were most pre-committed <laughs> to doing it were just the ones who did it. I guess I'm a little bit more open to the idea that if we were put into a situation like that, that we would get in line. And I, I don't know. I grew up in Eugene, Oregon, and the 70s and 80s. And so I knew lots of kids who grew up in communes. I knew lots, you know, it's like the home of like every kind of new religious movement came there to <laughs> kind of harvest, <laughs> harvest people. I even saw the Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh like uh, when I was a when I was uh, a kid on a on a, a science camp in Eastern Oregon. So yeah. that was definitely like a very early on sort of you know, thing that, that, so I don't know. I think that people fall into these. And then once you're in there, you know, I don't think it's, I, I think, sure, there must be certain kinds of personality traits that people are like, I'm out of here, I'm gone. Right. And, or, but, you know, I'm not sure once you get, once you get that sense of, of connection with others, once you really feel strongly like this, it's very powerful. I think that we, become very um you know i think this the just the less one of the lessons of sociology is we we like to think of ourselves as being these very strong individuals but let's face it like you know we're not yeah <laughs> we're, we're susceptible right i mean it also reminds me of a, a research piece i read a couple of years ago uh, we interviewed him on this show by a guy named gregory martin and if i'm recalling this correctly he showed that like when people move to a Republican area, their attitudes become more Republican. And when they move to a Democrat, so that that that's very much in line with what you'd say is like we're human animals and it's our nature to conform. Absolutely. To groups to fit in. That's right. I'm not saying that there's zero kind of personality or, you know, that you don't get a little wiser as you get older. I mean, uh, in that way, at least, or maybe you don't have the same hormones that are being driven and, and, and toggled on and off. Like, you know, a lot of these groups, the youths, you know, there's, there's about sex and attraction. Youth these days. Yeah. I mean, we say, we see that in, in social movements of all types. Where would you say the, the, the borders of your kind of charismatic leader? Because you, you talk about it being a continuum, right? So so where would be some examples of, of like something like Heaven's Gate would obviously fit one, continue, one, one part of it, right? Would political movements fall into this culty way that you're describing it? So, so 
the way I think about the charisma in this case is it's not really about the leader. It's about the group. Right. So it's a it's a more of a it's a different definition of charisma than I think a lot of sociologists right. think of. Right. So the, the Weberian charismatic is like someone who's always kind of trying to keep people off their trail, being erratic and doing these things so that nobody can actually question uh, that person's authority. I'm thinking more in terms of groups being along a continuum of charismatic group. Right. And the, the idea is that a lot of groups ultimately that survive, like the communes that have been around for decades or even hundreds of years, are the ones that have institutionalized charisma, mm -hmm. that they've created mechanisms for generating commitment in new followers and sustaining it in the group. So Rosabeth Moss Cantor has this typology about commitment mechanisms. And, and I, you know, I think it, I think it, it holds pretty well that at some point, if you can institutionalize the awe mm -hmm. that is in the group, right, that's one of the things that the, the, the leader is doing, especially in these early stage groups. It's about trying to get people to have this sense of awe and wonder. Right. And that's part of the that's part of what's generating that collective effervescence. Wow. We're really it's really being revealed to us all of these things. Right. And so but once the leader, you know, dies or leaves or is, you know, yeah, something does something terrible. Right. It's very hard for that awe to be passed on. So it has to be institutionalized in in the in various ways. Right. So how do you get that? One could make the argument that, you know, a lot of places like universities are very successful at institutionalizing awe. You know, uh, yeah, I, I went to lots of state schools that had pretty funky, funky architecture. They didn't, inst they didn't <laughs> inspire much awe. Then you go to some, this, so these places, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to, I'm in a church. I'm in a castle. I'm so unworthy. Why did I, pop, why, you know, all this imposter syndrome. I don't deserve to be here. I better work my ass off to just, yeah. you know, that on the continuum of, of, of things is, is a little bit more institutionalizing the awe, <laughs> you know, and I would say that we could do the same thing with a number of these commitment mechanisms, thinking about getting people to show up, to have a sense of connection with each other, um, how you, and how you toggle like, um, these different ways of getting people to really belong to the group. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm getting at. I think it's a continuum. Mm -hmm. I think just as, as, as Joseph was saying that I think that, and I think Rick, you know, your point about the cult label being unproductive here is like, if we could think about this along a continuum of, of more or less charismatic groups, and then we could layer on top of that. Well, are they actually doing something in the world in general that is, you know, productive or unproductive? <laughs> right. Then, you know, it's a little bit like the move we always do in sociology that we kind of have to be cultural relativists. It's like mm -hmm. Howie, Howie Becker doesn't say like, you know, this pot smoking group is like bad. <laughs> That's because he was smoking pot with them. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, structurally, they're like a wine, they're like wine enthusiasts. Right. And even that, you know, right. it's yeah. like not, uh, and then we have to decide, like, if this is for ill or, or, or good, I guess. And then obviously a lot of the world is in the gray, the, the very gray territory. <laughs> I, I remember my father telling me that, you know, in clinical psychology, things are a trait until they harm somebody's ability to function in society. And then it becomes a pathology. Mm. So it's like, mm -hmm. you know, small doses of anything are probably what give groups or people their character. The problem comes when the trait is so strong that it causes self-harm mm -hmm. or harm to the adherence or someone else. I think that's probably the line. This was a real turn on the lights <laughs> on a topic for me. I learned a lot awesome. from both of you, and I am very fun. grateful. So thank you very much. Super fun. Thank you. You've been listening to the Annex of Sociology podcast. A special thank you to our guests, Rick Moore from Washington University of St. Louis and Craig Rawlings from Duke University. We're on the web, theannexpodcast.com, on Twitter, at Socianex, and on Facebook, the Annex Sociology podcast. Music is by Lena Orsa. The Annex is a production of the Queen's Podcast Lab. For more, visit queenspodcastlab.org. I'm Joe Cohen. Thanks for listening.